Well, please take your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. John, chapter 21. And Let me just be, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you, Lord, uh, thankful for the love that you have poured out on us. Lord, and thankful, uh, Lord, for your word, for the ministry of your spirit that applies it to our lives. I pray, Lord, this morning that you will speak to us, Lord, and that we would not harden our hearts against what you have for us this morning. Uh, bless us, Lord, through the hearing of your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Well, um, recently, a few few weeks ago, I watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof again. Uh, I, I like that movie. Uh, and one of the scenes, Tevi uh, asked his wife, Golda, his wife of 25 years, do you... Love me. You know, and ever since that time, the Lord has been prompting me with that question. Franz, do you love me? Now, this week we are celebrating our 11th anniversary as a church. And as our custom, we take this month and have some uh, Thanksgiving services, and today we give thanks for our church. And as I was praying about a Thanksgiving message to give to us, this question keeps popping up in my mind. Do you love me? And so I thought, well, that is probably a question the Lord has for all of us. This was, of course, a question that Jesus asked Peter after he had denied him. And so I want to ask us this question, as I've been asking myself this question, from the Lord. Church, do you love me? Uh, it's, it's an unsettling question, I have to admit it, because it's usually asked... When there's been reason to doubt that we have love for Christ. Maybe it's something we've done or something we've said or not. Maybe there is an attitude that has emerged from us. Perhaps a, a lack of appreciation. Perhaps a lack of interest or, or even indifference. Attitudes that would cast doubt on our love on whether it's real or whether it's genuine or, or whether it is as big as we say it is or as fervent as we claim it to be. It's also a, a penetrating question because it strikes right at the heart, at the core of our being. After all, who we are are very much determined by what or who we love. But thankfully, it is also a redeeming question, for it forces us to consider the depth and the sincerity of our love, and by God's grace, have it restored, have it rekindled, have it revived. You see, love is, is central to, to the Christian faith. I mean, the greatest commandment that we have is what? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you love me like this? Wholeheartedly and unreservedly. Jesus said, if you love me, then you will obey my commandments. Do you love him in that way? Jesus says, the new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, 
that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you love me? Asked the Lord. Do you love one another? Do you love those whom I love? Do you love them as much as I love them? You see, love is, is the greatest virtue of the Christian faith. It's the truest response to the gospel. John 15, 13 tells us, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Romans 13, 10 tells us, Love is the fulfillment of the law. And every spiritual gift and every ministry and every work that we offer to God without love is nothing. That's what Corinthians 13 tells us. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but... Do not have love. I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. See, the church in Ephesus stumbled in this regard. They had knowledge. They had truth. They were persevering in their faith. They endured but they have left their first love. They've stopped doing it out of love for Christ. And 1 Corinthians 16 reminds us, verse 14, that let all that you do be done in love. So the question before us this morning is, do you love the Lord? Paul wrote in, or in 2 Corinthians 5 that... The love of Christ should control us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and that he died for all so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And that led Paul later to write in Philippians 1 verse 21 that he says, for me to live is Christ. Christ is all to me, everything to me. He says in Galatians 2.20 that I have been crucified with Christ. I, I no longer live. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so even if we can say that or desperately want to say that and want it to be true of us, it is sometimes hard to know what does that look like? How do we do that? How do I express such love to the Lord? And I think part of the answer, at least, we find here in John 21, in the restoration of Peter, when he was asked by the Lord, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And so let's, Look at, I need to, need to paint a little bit of a background scene for us before we come into this passage. Peter, or Simon, was the most prominent of the disciples. He was a leader among leaders. He was the spokesman of the twelve. He was always quick with an answer, ready with a response or a decision, which also meant that he often get, got things wrong. Uh, someone unkindly said that Peter was the foot-shaped mouth disciple meaning he always put his foot in his mouth, as the saying would go. But at one time, he got it right. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded with an answer from God, the Father, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon confessed Jesus of Nazareth, to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, to be the anointed one, the long-awaited king. He is the son of God. Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh, 
God with us, Emmanuel. That's what all of entail into that confession. And then Jesus, by virtue of his name and by his nature, is a savior. His name means to save. He's a savior. And his nature is love. And it's the love of God that moved him to give his life in order to save sinners. And so Jesus commended Peter for his confession and changed his name. He says, now you will be called Peter, which means rock. And he says, on this confession, on the rock of this confession, on those like you who make it, I will build my church. And so I'm sure a bit elated and maybe perhaps with pride inflated, no sooner had Peter made this profession or this confession than he sought to stop Jesus from going to the cross, from fulfilling the will of the Father. He sought to keep Jesus from drinking the cup of God's wrath. For our sins on the cross. He sought to keep Jesus from expressing his love in this way. And so Jesus rebuked him. Uh, tell him not to act like an agent of Satan. Opposing the will of God. And that must have stung quite a bit I think to, for Peter. His pride must have been dented but not broken because he was a prideful man. Closer to Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus warned Peter that Satan was seeking permission to sift his faith like wheat, but that Jesus had prayed for him that his faith would not fail, and then after he had returned, that he should strengthen his brothers in Christ. We read that in Luke 22. Then Jesus told him that... That's the disciples, that they would fall away. As the scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And Peter proudly proclaimed, others may fall away, but I will never fall away. And Jesus warned him that before the night is over, and before the rooster crow, he will deny him three times. And so Jesus was arrested later that night, and Peter was ready to fight. He would cut off the ear of Malchus. He did not deny the Lord when he was confronted by, by Judas and a cohort of soldiers. But not long after that, they was standing in the courtyard of the high priest around a charcoal fire, warming themselves. And when a servant girl challenged him and says, you are one of them. This one was with Jesus. And Peter denied knowing Jesus. He denied being with Jesus. He called down curses on himself saying, I do not know this man. And after that third denial, the rooster crowed. And Luke tells us that at that moment, in the courtyard, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had told him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he wept out, and cried bitterly. See, pride made him deny his Lord. Self-centered pride and self-exalting pride. See, self-centered pride is when we look out primarily for self, for our own interests. We are most important in our lives. We are central to our lives. Our needs, my needs, my wants, my achievements, my goals, my agenda, that's primary. How I feel is more important than how anyone else feels. How I, what I want is more important than anyone, what anyone else wants. 
That is self-centered, self-focused pride. But it's also self-exalting pride. And this is when you present yourself to be better than what you truly are. And so your stories are always exaggerated. And you make others small, bad-mouthing them so that you would look better. And both of these forms of pride, I think, was revealed in this occasion. These, pride, these forms of pride reveals a love for self. Peter denied Jesus to protect himself. That self-focused pride. He, he wanted to, to protect himself in this hostile crowd. He would deny Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, because he wanted to protect himself. And he wanted to exalt himself. He doesn't want to look bad in front of those around the fire. I don't know this man. I'm not like them. You see, Jesus demands of his disciples that they would deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow him. That means deny your self-centered, self-focused pride. Stop looking out only for your own interests but start looking out for the interests of others. Pick up your cross. Crucify your self-exalting pride. Humble yourself. Bear the shame of the cross. Bear the foolishness of the gospel. And follow me. Walk in my ways. Listen to my words. And Jesus says, if we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father in heaven. But if we consistently, persistently deny Jesus, his calling and his claim upon, on our lives before men, then ultimately one day he will deny us before the Father in heaven. Why? Because we have never followed him. We, have, we may have followed him, but for us, not for him. And so Peter denied the Lord because he would not deny himself. Peter denied the Lord because he loved himself more than he loved the Lord. And I think each one of us can probably think of a situation in which we have Denied Jesus. Perhaps not denied knowing him, but refuse him. Deny to follow him as he calls us to follow him. Deny confessing him in front of others when things are a little bit uncomfortable. Denied not obeying him. Denied his call on our lives and his claim on our lives. And sometimes it is because of immaturity. We all are growing in our faith in Christ. But more often it is because of our pride. Our self-focused and self-exalting pride. We love ourselves more than we love the Lord. And so coming to John chapter 21 we find in verses 1 and 2 that, that uh, Peter and the disciples were up at the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Jesus had already at this stage appeared to them twice, first time without Thomas and then the second time with Thomas. And just in the previous chapter, chapter 1, really the, the, the crescendo in one sense of the Gospel of John is that Thomas saw the Lord, saw the marks in his hands and the wound in his side, and he exclaimed, my Lord and my God. And here we find them up in the Sea of Tiberias, uh, and it's not because 
They've absconded. The Lord commanded them through an angel that they should go up to, the, to Galilee so that he would meet with them there. We, we read that in Matthew 28, uh, 7 and 10. And, and so there were six others with Peter up next to the Sea of Tiberias. And Peter said, well, I'm going fishing. Uh, and six others said, okay, we'll come and help you. Uh, but verse 3 is they caught nothing. And so while they were fishing, they saw early in the morning Jesus on the shore. And he instructed them, he asked whether they had caught anything, and they said nothing. And so he instructed them to cast their nets on the other side, the right side of the boat, and they caught a large number of fish. Another miracle. And when the disciples realized that it was the Lord Jesus, Peter put on his outer garment and jumped overboard. You can say he went overboard for the Lord. But when they reached the shore, and Jesus had already got a charcoal fire going with bread and fish cooked for breakfast. Another miracle, I think so. And then coming to our passage in verse 15, verses 20, well, verses 15, and I'll read through to 22. Just follow along as I read. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And truly, truly, I say to you, when you, pardon me, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, and the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is it? Who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. We'll read up to there. And really, in this, in this passage, we, we see the question that Jesus asked, Do you love me? As well as we get an answer to this question, or at least how to measure our love for the Lord. I mean, this is an answer that we actually Jesus had given before. He has given this answer before to Peter shortly after he sought to uh, keep him from the cross. After he confessed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, he tried to stop Jesus denying Jesus from denying himself and picking up his cross and following the will of the Father. He said to them, if anyone wants to follow or come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. And that's what we see in this passage. The answer that Jesus gives Peter as he restores him back to ministry. And so people, to truly and fully and sincerely love the Lord Jesus is to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to follow him. Let me, let me show this from, from, from this passage. First of all, pride sort of promotes self or focuses on self, but love focuses on Jesus and on others. And love 
denies self. As I said, Peter had denied the Lord three times around a charcoal fire. And here, there's so many parallels. There's a charcoal fire again. And here the Lord asks him three times the same question as he seeks to humble Peter and yet build him up, restore him again as well. And so the first question we read, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He called him Simon. The name he had before his confession, before he said, made the confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Before he had his name changed to Peter, the rock, he was Simon, the son of John. And that must have stung Peter that he was no longer called by Jesus, Peter, but Simon. And I think the Lord did that on purpose. He wanted to shake Peter. And so he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He used the word for the Greek word agapao for love, a love that speaks of commitment, of dedication, of devotion. It is a love that is expressed primarily through an act of one's will. It's a decision one makes. It's a commitment one makes to act for the benefit of or the best interest of another, regardless of how you may feel at that time. So it's, it's regardless of emotion. This is the kind of love we are called to show towards enemies. We, we are not called to like them, but we need to love them. We need to have their best interest at heart, and we need to be willing to care for them, regardless of whether they are worthy of that kind of love. And so Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Are you more committed to me than these? And so the question is, what is, what is this, these? Well, some say it was the other disciples. And so Jesus asked him, do you love these others more than you love me? And it's a legitimate, probably, consideration, but I think it's foreign to the context here. Another thing is to consider is these things may be these things, the, the fishing um, equipment, the boat and the nets and, and all of that. Say, do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than this lifestyle? Do you love me more than what this can provide for you? Again, a legitimate consideration. Uh, but only if you understand or think that Peter wanted to return back to his old life, uh, which I think is not the case because they were up in Galilee because out of obedience to the Lord. The third option, and the one I prefer, is he's comparing Peter's commitment with his others, the other disciples. Do you love me more than they love me? Are you more committed to me than they are, Peter? I mean, Peter, Jesus was taking Peter back to that self-exalting pride, that boast that he gave. Even if they all fall away, I will never fall away. Just, just flip back to John 13. I think it's important for us to, to read that. John 13, the context here is, is um, uh, really the disciples was first of all quibbling about who's the greatest. And then Jesus indicated that he was going to be betrayed. Uh, uh, and then that he was going to be departing. And he emphasized the need for his disciples to love one another. So John 13 verse 33 reads, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. 
And Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. To love the Lord is to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to follow him. And I'm sure Peter's eyes were misting up when he heard those words. And so he replies and says, Lord, you know that I love you. And he used the Greek word phileo, which means a friendship like affection, an attraction. And so Peter could not bring himself to confess that I have a full love for you, Lord. I have a committed love for you. Peter said, Jesus, you know, I, I have great affection for you. I am personally attracted to you and attached to you. He did not make any further bold proclamations about the superiority of his commitment to the Lord, greater than those of the other disciples. And so Jesus commanded him, tend my lambs. If you love me, then tend my lambs. If you love me, then stop denying me Deny yourself and serve me. Serve my people. Tend my lambs. And the word tend really is, is a shepherding term that speaks of uh, really taking care of the flock, but with an emphasis on feeding them, making sure that they are fed, making sure they have enough to eat. And so for Peter, it meant, Peter, feed my sheep my word. Feed them the bread of life. Give them the words of life. And lambs, of course, is a synonym for sheep. And Jesus used the metaphor of sheep and flock of those who belong to him. And so Jesus is saying, if you love me, deny yourself and serve me. Serve me by serving my people. Tending my lambs. And Peter's pride was, I'm sure, cracked by this time, but not crushed. And so Jesus asked him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, Jesus used the word agapao for love. This time, he's not asking Peter, do you love me? Are you more committed to me than they are? He is just questioning his very commitment. Are you actually committed to me? Do you love me? Is that true? He was delivering another painful blow to Peter's pride. And Peter, no doubt, deeply humbled by his denial of the Lord, says, Lord, you know I have affection for you. I have a Friendship, love for you. He could not bring himself to assert that he was committed to the Lord. That he had full love for Jesus. Agapao love for Jesus. Especially after what he had done. And just on the side, don't think that Jesus, or rather Peter's uh, expression of Phileo love for, for Jesus is, is something trivial or nothing. It's actually profound because Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, that if anyone does not love the Lord, if anyone does not phileo the Lord, let him be accursed. We have to have an affection for Christ, but we have to be more than a mere affection for Christ. We have to be committed to him. And so Peter's love, his affection was not insignificant, but it was not self-denying. He had great affection for the Lord. He loved him as his best friend, no doubt. But because of his denial, he could not bring himself to say, Lord, I agapao you, I am committed to you. 
And again, gen Jesus gently commanded him, shepherd my sheep. Love my sheep. Be committed to my sheep, my people, my church. If you have affection for me, then care for them. Show them your love for me. Stop denying me and start denying yourself by serving my people. I mean, shepherd, again, is a shepherding term, very similar to, to tending, but a little bit broader in meaning, including protecting and, and, and leading and, and, and feeding as well. And Jesus says, if you have affection for me, as you claim you have, then show it, express it, by denying yourself and shepherding my sheep. But still Jesus was not done. He asked him a third time. And with this question, I think he drove the stake right through the prideful heart of Peter and crushed him. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you even phileo me? Do you have, do you have affection for me? As you claim, you do. And Peter was grieved. He was hurt by the Lord for asking him three times whether he loved him, whether he had affection for him. And still, he could not bring himself to say, Lord, I am committed to you. The crushing reality of his denials of Jesus meant that he could not, he would not claim agapao love for Jesus. The best he could offer was affection. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I have affection for you. And Paul again used, that's not Paul, Peter used two different words here, or rather John used two different words, but Peter when he's saying it, he uses a word for no oida, which means you gain information, like you may have read it or you may have heard about it. Um, so you, you have knowledge. And he's basically saying, Lord, you are omniscient. You know, you know all things. You... No, are using a different word. Gnosko, meaning you know because you have experienced it. It's, 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 you, this knowledge was acquired personally. You have seen it. You felt it. Lord, you know that I love you, that I have affection for you. You've experienced it when I, when I ask you to wash not only my feet, but all of me. Lord, you've experienced it when I wanted to walk on water with you. Lord, you've experienced me when, when I wanted to build tents for you and, and Moses and Elijah when you were transformed. Lord, you experienced it when I cut off the ear of Malchus. You know that I have affection for you. You are my best friend. And Jesus again answered with the same commandment. Tend my sheep. If you love me, if you have affection for me, then love my flock. Love my people. Deny yourself. Deny your preferences, your comfort. And serve them. Look after them. Continue, we see that love denies self, but love also picks, pick up its cross and follow Jesus. Verse 18 to 22, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow, grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Jesus explained to Peter how he would glorify God in his death. 
The phrase, stretch out your hands, means to be crucified. It was a term that was used to signify crucifixion. And according to tradition, Peter was crucified, and he was crucified upside down because he did not want to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. And so Jesus is saying, Peter, you will literally have to pick up your cross. You have to deny yourself, tending my lambs, shepherding my sheep, tending my sheep, and then pick up your cross, literally. Peter, you are going to die on the cross. You are going to go the same way that I went. Follow me. Stop denying me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Most of us are called only to pick up our cross figuratively. We have to die in a figurative way, die to ourselves, to our own pride, our self-exalting pride. We have to sh suffer the shame of the gospel. We have to suffer the foolishness of the gospel. We may suffer rejection, opposition, hostility, even persecution. But we are called in every situation to pick up our cross, to be willing to die to self, And Peter asks, well, what, about, what about John? What about him? What will happen to him? Peter is again comparing, looking around. And Jesus essentially said to him, don't look at others. Don't compare yourself with others. Don't compare your love for me with their love for me. Don't compare my, your denial of yourself with their denial of the self. If I want you to pick up your cross and die on the cross, if I want you to give your life for me, don't look at others. They will have their cross to bear. You follow me, Jesus said. My example, my way. And so people, Jesus asked us this morning, do you love me? And we have to remember that pride is the antithesis of love. Pride is self-focused, self-exalting. And those attitudes will kill your love for Christ and for others. So to answer this question, do you love me? Examine your heart. Is pride lurking there? Are you still more concerned about self than others? Own comfort, own agendas, own goals, own ideas. Are you still comparing yourself with others? Well, at least I'm not as bad as them. I, I'm really committed. Look, I serve the Lord. Look at myself. I, I sacrifice for the Lord. Pride can be so deceptive that it catches us even in the good works that we seek to do. And so if we want to know if we love the Lord, then see if you deny yourself. See if you pick up your cross. See if you follow him. Do you love me? The Lord already knows that answer. He knows your heart. And I pray that each one of us would prayerfully and faithfully ask the Lord to show us, if need be, humble us as he humbled Peter, so that we may Ask him to forgive us. Ask him to revive us in our love for him 
and others. Let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have loved us by giving your life to us, for us. And Lord, you ask us for us to follow you, that, that we would deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow you. And Lord, I'm, so often we can think of times and situations where we failed you, where we denied you because we will not deny ourselves. We sidestep, sidestep the cross because we would not pick it up. We do not follow you because we follow ourselves or the world. And we pray, Lord, forgive us. And restore us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.